All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, okay. If anybody has any questions during, feel free to raise your hand and interject. Um, I'll try to project a little bit more. The mic is being funny and wanting to give feedback. Um, if anyone has questions or if the deaf audience wants to participate and say, whoa, you're big time off there, uh, please do. Um, and if you have any questions along the way or something doesn't make sense, stop me. The purpose of this is more to lay a groundwork moving forward. If the Lord grows the amount of deaf people that we have coming, we want to be the church, not a church within a church. We want to genuinely interact as the body. And part of that means that some of you may not even learn sign language, but you need to know more about deaf culture because it's a whole nother world. We had a Sunday evening where we discussed some of this. If you're here for that, one of the things I emphasized was you may think, oh, deaf people, they're just like me, except they can't hear. That's true. But it's more than that. It's a whole different language and a whole different culture, a whole different way of looking at things. And so in that, naturally, there's going to be some things that are a little bit odd seeming on the surface where you might see someone thinks in a different way or speaks in a different way. Um, and if you know ahead of time, hey, this is a different language and a different culture and a different way of seeing things, you're going to be better prepared for that. Um, and so that's the main goal for this. The second goal is to encourage anyone who's interested in taking the sign language classes we have coming up. Uh, it's going to be very, very basic, but it will give you a working ability to strike up a conversation with a deaf person. And from there, that's where you're really gonna learn. Um, so be grateful for the deaf people that are here. They're the type that will be patient and will teach you. They'll do more than I could ever do in that regard. So I'm just giving you the, the first step and you've got to take it the rest of the way. That makes sense. If later on someone decides, hey, I want to help out at church interpreting or whatnot, we can, we can work on that individually as, as that comes up. And that's the goal long term, very long term, is that we have more than just me. <laughs> um, it's, it's not healthy physically speaking, from a human perspective, to have just one interpreter. But if you've noticed, I've brought in two interpreters today. Mentally, it's also taxing. What I'm doing Sunday to Sunday is genuinely of the Lord that He's providing the grace for that to happen and not have me fall apart or completely be putting forth heresy unknowingly. And we'll get into some of that in, in some examples. Um, I was asked, I was, this was not my plan at all, but I was asked to share a little bit of how I became involved in the deaf world. Um, I needed a language credit in high school and college. My mother says I didn't need the credit so much as she was pushing me to actually pick a class when I was taking dual credit in high school. Um, I, I guess I had misunderstood some things there. Nonetheless, I was pushed into a sign language class and actually ended up loving it. It was exactly where the Lord wanted me to be. I had no idea or aspirations as far as career was concerned, had no idea what I was going to do, and started meeting deaf people and fell in love with the language and, and the culture. And uh, from there, the Lord led me to interpreting. And so it's been his hand all the way through. Um, I have an associate's degree in interpreting. I spent uh, a semester as a visiting student at Gallaudet University. It's uh, the first and only deaf college uh, in the world. Um, there are other deaf pockets in other colleges, but that's the deaf college um, that you'll hear about. Um, from there, I got an, I'm sorry, a bachelor's degree in ASL studies. It's actually a degree to teach ASL, except that I didn't pursue the teaching certification to prove that I can teach. That was not my aim. It's not what I desired. Um, my goal was interpreting. So that's my background. Any more questions, and you can ask them later on, I suppose. Um, I wanted to open with teaching you how to fingerspell. There's a piece of paper in the back that you can pick up if you haven't yet on your way out, and it gives you the, the manual alphabet. And when I'm teaching you this, I'm not teaching you ASL. Now, I'm, I'm playing on the linguistic perspective of things to to sort of emphasize something, I'm teaching you how to say an English word visually. So don't think, oh, I can spell my name. I know some sign language. 
um, the deaf person will roll their eyes and, no, please, no. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, the deaf person is going to see your effort as a positive thing. But don't think going into it, I can spell everything. That's not how the language works. That's a means of bridging the two worlds um, and connecting the two languages. Am I correct on that? All right, good deal. So I'll walk you through the alphabet briefly and we'll review it later on. This is just to get your feet wet. I'm going to ask our deaf visitors if they would help me watch. If you're uh, doing a letter completely illegibly, they'll help you um, reshape that letter. But I'd like you to at least follow along, at least so that you can learn that basic thing of, of spelling and you'll know how to spell your name from that. Um, the first letter is A. B. I have a question. Sure. Is that which hand you use? Whatever your dominant hand is, whatever you write with, um, if you have a preference, that's the hand that you use. Doesn't really matter, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. So A, B, your thumb is in front. Right, and I'm hearing from the deaf audience, your dominant hand is best, yes. C. And when, when you're signing, you don't want to strain your hand and try to face your letter out. And you also don't want to be looking at it yourself because you're not the one you're talking to. Whatever's comfortable and forward facing. So C, D. That's actually an F. If you bring your middle finger down, there you go. And the rest of the hand closed, perfect. D. E. If you do like this, someone, uh, someone's going to complain at you um, eventually. Your fingers do rest on your thumb. E. F. Oddly enough, this is also the number nine. Have fun. <laughs> G. Good. If your thumb is down or up, it doesn't really matter. Do y'all have a preference? You do it with the thumb up. H. Just adding your middle finger there. Good. Not really. <laughs> this is just cleaner to have your thumb down, but that's just a preference that I've learned. I. Your hand will be the other way. There you go. And the J is going to follow this hand shape, but it's going to go down, tracing out the shape of a J. If you do it the opposite direction, they'll look at you funny. You need to know, hang on, this J, K. So you make a peace sign and lower your middle finger. Good. Now when you go to do a P, it's the same thing, but the hand is positioned downward. So there's your P. Is it the first knuckle or the second knuckle? It doesn't matter, so your, your thumb is in that general area, yeah. Once you get into fingerspelling, if you watch me fingerspell while I'm interpreting, you're not focusing on that. You're seeing the whole shape. <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. You'll have to forgive me, I'm already brain dead from L, that's it, yes. L. M. Your thumb is going to go under your first three fingers. So you know the, the is this a Boy Scout thing? Or, so it's like that, but you bring your three fingers down. M. Your N is going to be two fingers. You just take your ring finger out of the equation. Good deal. O. Pretty simple. P. Q. It's a G, but down. R. You're not hoping for anything. This is just an R. <laughs> S. This is very different than an A. There's your A. 
Here's your S. There you go. T is like M and N, except that T is one finger over your thumb. U. Y'all are doing great. V. W. This is six. Again, have fun. X. Y. <laughs> and Z. Z. Good deal. The other reason I showed you that beyond just the practical application is to show you something that's pretty interesting. Sign languages around the world are different from one another. Here in America, we have American Sign Language. That's why it's called ASL. When I was in London interpreting, I was learning British Sign Language. They spell with two hands. So if you thought that was hard, <laughs> of course, the British look at us and think that we're crazy. Yeah, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. <laughs> Q R S T U V W X Y Z. So, even in the spelling of an English word, which is just a representation of English, it's extremely different. Um, much less words that are used in different languages. Now, Signed languages are not based on spoken languages. They're visually based languages. Um, and we'll get into that more later, but I wanted to emphasize the point. Sign language is not universal. Um, Canada and America use American Sign Language, and that goes back to the history of deaf education. Deaf people came here and went home to Canada and established deaf schools and carried back American Sign Language with them. Um, and there are pockets around the world that have a strong ASL influence because we've been so uh, proactive in education of the deaf. Um, but for the most part, most languages around the world are different depending on what uh, area of the world you go to or what country you land in. Some countries even have multiple signed languages in the same country, um, which is pretty interesting. All right, so along those lines, you have a language that's not based on any spoken language. It's visually based, completely independent. Um, and you also have a cultural minority. So culture is based on your experiences uh, and your values. And for a deaf person, this is very different. They see the world very differently than you might. Um, your world, you have a lot of visuals in it, but you have a very large degree of uh, sound-based things not only speech, but if you were to sit down and track all of the things that you pay attention to sound on, the deaf person has to use their eyes. And so over time, there have been many inventions for the deaf that you might find surprising once you get to know deaf people. They're very, very interesting, very cool and inventive. But so I've, I've drawn out that there is a linguistic difference and a cultural difference. And that's why deaf people consider themselves a linguistic and cultural minority. That's just to distinguish the fact that they see the world in a different way and they speak a different language. So when you think a deaf person is just like me except they don't hear, you're right. But it's more than that. They have a whole other language and a whole different culture. Now, that being said, they live in America. So they have American influences and they have a large degree of American culture that's not the same to other cultures around the world adopted into their culture. And so a lot of times you might see um, you might see cultures that interact very often with one another and they will have an impact on each other. And so you've seen a Venn diagram before. And so there will be some shared similarities across both cultures. Um, and honestly, this is a better depiction because this is how the deaf world typically sees it is that there's hearing down here. If you don't know what you're called, you're called hearing. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and deaf culture down here. And a person, whether they can hear or not, can be anywhere along this line, culturally speaking, if that makes sense. Any questions on that? Am I making sense? Okay, good. So you see I wrote deaf with a capital D there. That's the, because it's a proper name of a group of people, it's capitalized. Um, deafness as the condition pertaining to the ear is with a small d. Um, but speaking of a cultural group, it's with a capital D. So if you see that and you think, why is the D capitalized? That's why. Um, let's see. In the Sunday night that we did before, uh, something that's kind of crucial to understand as far as culture is concerned, 90 to 95% of deaf children are born to parents that hear, that are hearing like you. More than 88% of those parents do not make any attempt to learn sign language. So the deaf person grows up mostly um, with no language at home, at least no visual language. Now, the deaf person might be hard of hearing. There are differing degrees and there are different situations for every person. Something that I've got to warn you against is I'm speaking in generalities about a large amount of people with a lot of individuals in it. And the same way you see people around you are all very different and yet you're all hearing. Same for the deaf people. Um, but I'm giving you a big picture overall view. And so the average deaf person grows up without parents that speak to them um, in a visual language. At school, increasingly so, schools that you see, public schools around, those are considered mainstream schools by people in the deaf community because you're putting a deaf person in the mainstream culture. Um, often those schools do employ interpreters. Many times they aren't the best, but beyond that, the teachers don't know how to teach to deaf people typically. And in a lot of schools that don't have interpreters, but they have deaf ed teachers, some deaf teachers are great. And then other times, majority of the time, I would say, the administration doesn't know who to hire and doesn't know who's qualified. So they hire the first person they come along that can hear and talk to them. That makes it easier for them to talk amongst the staff. And they hire a person who in reality doesn't sign very well. So that the average deaf person is commonly going to school, uh, not able to communicate well with the teachers that do wave their hands in the air, but that's what they do is they wave their hands, not necessarily sign very well. Uh, and I'm sorry if that's a little harsh, but it's, it's the truth. And so the average deaf person often grows up, not all, but the average deaf person grows up, so instead of signing, they sign um, with the teachers at school. Amongst the other deaf people, they, they typically even develop their own little pockets of regional signs because they're around other deaf kids. That develops quite naturally off of what they do get. Um, but then with their teachers and their parents, they're not getting very much at all. The reason I'm explaining all this is not to, to make you pity deaf people, not in the least, but to give you an idea of what their culture is like and what they've grown up experiencing that helps you understand why there are certain values. So in cultures, you have different cultures and those different cultures have different values. Does anybody know the term individualistic? Right? You know what collectivist is? It's the opposite, more group think. And so if you've done any study of cultures at all, you know that uh, individualistic cultures are like, like ours in America. Um, instead of spelling out the whole world word, I'll put individualistic and, co and collectivist, an I and a C. Um, and so over here, our culture typically is very centered on the person. Um, when you have that, we think of ourselves first and others second, typically. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing or necessarily even sinful in the cultural sense that I'm meaning, not necessarily meaning selfish. But uh, as far as our, our values are concerned, we value personal rights, privacy, 
uh, all those things that we would see in the Constitution as far as the individual's rights. We value that and very heavily. The deaf person does too. But you'll remember the, the picture I've painted for you of the average deaf person. They're typically growing up in a group where they have other deaf people around them. Their parents don't talk to them. The teachers can't communicate very well with them, but they can communicate with each other and they operate as a tight-knit group very often. Am I being accurate? Jenna? Right? Okay. I noticed that, um, that I work with special needs children and I had a class for like four years and I noticed that the parent and the child had their own language. Hmm. So we had to kind of figure out what their language was and how to work with them. But we did the same thing, trying to start with the sign language. Right. So they, we noticed that they did develop their own in their own household. Right. In the deaf world, it's very similar. Um, they have what's called home signs. And they'll, ha they'll develop some sort of communication, something that sparks and works in a moment that will be reused. And it's not linguistically a language but it's, it's making do and getting by. And so you'll have that very often in the deaf world, yeah. Um, so we think more individualistic. Typically, our values are very specific um, as far as uh, what we value is our time is a big deal. I mean, even in how we do church, not necessarily here, but just church in general, we have a schedule. And it's for the pres preservation of the personal individual's time more than uh, other things, at the expense of other things often, um, and good things. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because <laughs> being timely allows you to get more done. Having a schedule and structure is a good thing. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm contrasting it with the deaf person's view. I don't care how long I have to sit here. I want to understand Am I right? Exactly, she says. The, the hearing person grows up, gets information from anywhere and everywhere, not even paying attention. They hear something and they can zone in on a conversation. They're hearing things on the radio. They're hearing conversations between parents that they're not even engaged in. They're picking up stuff, things left and right. The deaf person has been told all their lives, what was so funny? Oh, never mind. Oh, I'll tell you later which means I'll tell you never. Be careful of that phrase around deaf people. Come and grab me. I'll interpret for you. But the deaf person just wants to get what's going on. They've not been allowed to do that. Um, oftentimes it's circumstances, but it's often parents that refuse to sign or, or teachers that are not competent to explain things fully and well so that it's clear. And so the deaf people have a whole different view on the world, even though they're sitting in the same room as you. Their value is more understanding and getting clear communication. And that's often erroneously valued more than the information itself sometimes. I'm not speaking of y'all, of course. But y'all can attest to the fact that uh, there are groups who are together in, for example, cults or bad churches that are teaching extremely false doctrine but people are going there not even believing what that is, but they're there for the community and to understand what's going on and to glean whatever they can get from the situation that's positive. Is that right? And so somewhere like here where we believe that we have the truth correct and we're interpreting the Bible well and we are caring about people and trying to do church properly, communication is that much more valuable. And clarity is that much more valuable. The deaf person would rather stay here longer and get more meat that they have been prevented from getting than we would necessarily because we see it everywhere and it's less valuable to us, I think, in, in one sense. Um, not that it's unappreciated, of course. I just mean by comparison of the two groups. Some interesting comparisons between the two groups that I'll give you. If you go to a seminar or uh, hear a sermon or a, uh, not so much a sermon because a preacher wants to be clear, 
but uh, a speech of some sort. And the speaker is just going over your head the entire way and using all sorts of big words and delving into analysis of things that you can't wrap your head around, don't quite understand. You often think, wow, he's so smart, all right? We value that, uh, that intellect. The deaf person, the way that their culture shows intellect, simple, clear, and everybody, everyone understands. And that reason is they have not had the access to the communication and they have not understood. Someone that can give me the information and I can understand it, yes, at last. Um, and that's the smart person. Somebody who can sign well is great, but the person that can sign to where I understand it instinctively on the same level as the hearing people and I just get it, I'm getting amens from the front row. <laughs> That's what they value. Um, the hearing culture, we prefer something with bullet points so that we can get across the information, get through it, I understand, all right, and my, my time is preserved. Conciseness, um, even some loss of information is acceptable. By comparison to the deaf world, they would rather stay there much longer so long as I fully understand it all the way through and clearly. Um, we, per, we prefer the control of information, privacy. You'll see a lot of things pop up in politics and whatnot. And the biggest thing that gets people in a tizzy, it seems like, is concern over privacy and personal privacy. We value that highly compared to the deaf world where um, Information sharing, which is a collectivist culture type of thing on the far end of the spectrum. Remember, they're growing up with other friends. That's where they're learning most of their valuable life lessons. Yeah, and she's saying, yeah, you're told things under the table. Hey, be careful of this, be careful of that. The essential information that we would just glean from natural stuff that we would hear in other people's conversations the deaf people are having to tell each other. One thing, for example, so you want me to stand or can you hear me okay? So one thing, for example, um, you know, say there's a teacher in a classroom and that teacher is teaching ASL class or something. Okay, so for a uh, hearing uh, class, they might be set up in a, a round table sort of discussion and say there's two deaf students and there's a hearing student that comes into the class late. Let's just say, for example, they come into the class late. <clears throat> so even if it's a hearing student, the hearing student will walk very, very, very quietly and get into their seat, right? They don't want to interrupt the class. And so the teacher will just keep on talking and keep going. But the deaf person's perspective is, wait, this, this person's late, why? You know, if a deaf person was late, they would come in and say, oh, I'm so sorry, traffic was horrible, there was an accident, the road was blocked, I had to find another way. And the deaf person would be like, oh, well, where was the accident? And they would expand on why they were late. And uh, after class was done, they would share information, be like, don't go this way back home, because that deaf person knows the news, but they didn't hear from the radio. so. Because they don't hear it from the radio, they share information. And uh, the deaf people um, share information with each other to find out what's going on. Hearing people don't have to do that because we hear everything. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, yes. When I was a student at Gallaudet, that's one of the things that I loved about the class. Going to a hearing college, you come in late, you just go sit down. And whatever you missed, tough, read it in the textbook. You go into a deaf college like Gallaudet and you have deaf teachers and you walk in, the classroom is set up in a semicircle so that if there are class discussions, you can see the other people. You're not looking at the back of people's heads. More than that, you walk in late, the teacher turns to you, what's up, what's wrong? There's a sense of group care, yes, but also uh, what's going on here? What's, something's off and I need to know what's going on. Another thing is, the teacher would often catch the student up in a concise way because of that cultural value of uh, sharing information, making sure things are clear. 
and the nature of the language being uh, very contextually based, depending on what you've heard before to understand the rest of the message, the teacher would often, okay, well, here's what we've been discussing and give them a quick synopsis on the whole thing. Completely different world right here. In a hearing person's speech, the clever little asides that you hear, um, the bunny trails, as you might call it, um, those things we see as clever, they're entertaining, and they help us keep our attention. The deaf world, it's off the point. It's not helping the clarity. It's causing confusion. It's bad news. <laughs> the deaf person that is clear and concise uh, uses time-based storytelling techniques, logic-based uh, speaking abilities in order to frame the entire thing and then give you the message at the end. And unless you have the full picture, stuff is missing and something doesn't sit right. Are you starting to see that there are two different worlds? <laughs> there are two different values there and even how we communicate. Um, we talked about the the efficiency and the dense communication of the hearing world. Um, the bigger words we, we can use, the better, uh, because I can pack more meaning into one word. Um, the deaf world prefers expansion. They prefer clarity in the fullness. I have to strike the balance when I'm interpreting, this is something you can pray for me on, is finding the right signs that are theologically sound and communicate the densest amount of information properly and correctly because the speaker is speaking to a particular culture in, in their set of values. And I have to use those signs to a culture that wants more expansion and more clarity and more lengthy communication. And so I'm having to balance the two. I'm, and Jen is saying, that's extremely tough. Yes. <laughs> so pray for me there. But you see the difference in, in the two. That's one of the other reasons that I like this. The more people that understand this, the less questions we'll have down the road, Lord willing, if we are able to have an additional deaf class or a deaf Sunday school, not in place of what we're doing necessarily, but in addition to, so that you see the cultural values there and how we're meeting that, so that it actually makes sense to you. And you're not thinking, those poor deaf people are here all day. Typically, that's what they want. Is that correct? You would prefer that rather than, yeah. So in that, you have two different groups. The interpreter is not interpreting words. The interpreter is being a facilitating communicator. He's bridging the gap, he or she is bridging the gap between two worlds, linguistically and culturally. They're a sort of mediator. Um, there are certain liberties that have to be given in order for the messages and the meaning to have the same impact in the other world. Uh, let's say you start making puns. Um, the deaf people are just going to be going, what is that about? Oh, the words sound alike. Okay, that does me a lot of good. <laughs> but if there's a visual way to present those puns, it may work, but that takes a lot of work. Think little things like that where the deaf world might put, thing in, put things in a certain way that I understand as a, a unique idiom in their world doesn't translate to you. Um, so I, I don't know. That's another aspect of it. Pray for me there. Um, we talked about my time versus everyone in the group understanding. Often there is, in, let's say if it's a deaf classroom like at Gallaudet or a deaf Sunday school, um, and the deaf teacher is teaching and they see someone who's normally very bright and engaged and they're just sitting there with a confused expression, they will often halt the entire class to zone in, what, what am I not saying clearly? How can I help you to understand? I want to make sure that everyone in the group is able to follow along. And that changes how long you're there, but it's, it's that value of access and clear communication that's that's there compared with if you don't understand talk to me afterwards <laughs> if you have any questions come talk to me later it's a very different cultural idea yeah all right so that gives you a little bit of, of a picture of the deaf world and and the culture 
difference between the two groups. Now, a deaf person grows up in a hearing world. They see things that go on. They are often adapting to your culture. Not always fully, but oftentimes the deaf person is adapting to you. Um, whereas their values may be somewhere else or what they prefer amongst their friends is different. It, some of you speak a different language um, and you've probably seen that uh, in other cultural groups too. Um, and that's typically happening here. However, there are some deaf people that don't grow up around other deaf people. They may be growing up and they're over on the hearing side of the culture spectrum. And so there are some deaf values that carry over for that individual person, but they may be very culturally hearing, so to speak. There are some hearing people that grow up with deaf parents who may be on the further side of deaf, even though they can hear. And so you have different people all along that. So again, don't think that this big picture is not, is not defining every deaf person. And they often jump between worlds. They're not stuck in one, even if they may hold those values. So don't let that confuse you in the, in the future. All right. I have scheduled a review of the finger spelling and a few signs to teach you. And then we'll have a bathroom break if that's all right with everyone. Does that sound good? All right. So let's review the finger spelling one more time. You'll have to practice this on your own. But I want to run through it again. Would you all help me again to make sure that uh, the signs are produced right? Thank you. A. B. C. D. E. Your fingers will be on top of your thumb. Very good. E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, <laughs> U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Y'all are fast. That's good. A few words that y'all can use. If you come to the ASL class, we won't do things this way. I won't be speaking. We'll be going very slow and trying to make sure that everyone understands using that deaf culture of value but we will be doing things most, mostly visually and signing teaching that way so that your mind is not stuck in English. You're actually learning the other language more natively and that's slow and it can be frustrating. But if you do that, you're setting yourself up for further success moving forward. But today I'm going to teach you a few words you can memorize at least for the starting of communication with deaf people so that you can go approach a deaf person and say, hi, this is my name. What's your name? All right. So the first sign we have is name. It's two H's. Name. Name. And it's two taps. Now I'm going to give you the, the I forget what they're even called, the questions. The who, what, when, where, how, why. All right. What? Now with this... You have to raise your eyebrows because you're asking a question. What? Do you prefer what? This is the old sign. What? 
gotten rid of that one. Yeah. <laughs> now it's more it's more of a C based type or an English signing based. So really it's a different concept. We've kind of gotten rid of that. We'll talk about C in a moment. It's signed English. Sign, signed exact English. So what? How? You're doing two C's almost. How? Your palms do face inward. It's not this so much as it is this. Good. Actually, I don't have the rest here. Who, what, when? Do you imagine a clock? When? Do you prefer another one? Do you prefer another sign? She also spells when. When. It depends. It depends on the sentence. Mm -hmm. It really depends on what you're wanting to say. Uh, you can say when or when. Uh, a lot of deaf people, they tend to use this sign for when. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also an old sign, so I don't know about that one. But, yeah, we'll, we'll accept it. I've had a lot of deaf people get on to me for signing when. So I had to force myself to change to when. Who, what, when, where? Who? Who is almost like a G? Who? Goes right here at the, at the chin. Who? Who, what, when, where, how? It's five, right? Why? Why am I forgetting this? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's something that's very helpful. You, me, them, all of you, us. Now, you don't have to remember all of that right away, but that gives you a, a, a picture of what's going on there. If you're sitting here in the lunchroom and I say, and I'm pointing at you, I'm not necessarily even talking about you. This can also be a pronoun. I've already established we're talking about uh, Pastor Don, and he had surgery. He's not in the room, but I'm, I've already set up that we're talking about him and I've pointed. So the point is not always t I'm talking about you. So don't feel self-conscious. <laughs> but also, if I am talking about you, it's typically to catch the deaf group up on information that they aren't gleaning naturally. You'll remember they don't know who you are. If they were hearing, they might overhear your name from some other person. I might feed them your name. They might not know that you're married to so-and-so or that's your son or whatnot. And I'm catching them up on cultural information. You'll remember that I'm a mediator in that sense. So you'll have to trust me on that, I suppose. Unless you want to learn sign language and then you'll know the truth, right? <laughs> um, so if you wanted to, to say uh, my name is or your, what is your name, it's a little bit different because in sign language uh, we have possessive signs as well. So your, the open palm is signifying possession. My, uh, their, our. So you see the open hand is showing possession. So if I wanted to ask what your name was, I would say, So that's how you ask a deaf person their name. Good deal. So if you were to say what your name is, you would say, 
and you would spell out your name. Congratulations. <laughs> You've got the first test. You're, you've got your first set of homework instructions. I want you to introduce yourself to the deaf people whenever you have a chance. Not swarm them all right now during the bathroom break. But let's take a good uh, 10, 15 minutes and hit the restrooms and come back ready to pick it up. All right, we're going to come on back together. not picking on you. I'm going to use an example. I just showed a deaf culture thing. Um, Jenna was on her way back to her seat and she's having to maneuver all these chairs to make sure she's not banging into things. Uh, she could not listen to what I was saying until she's able to look up. Uh, and so I waited for her to make her way back to her seat. So it's another picture of, of deaf culture and how things are done differently. Whereas we might not think about that sort of thing, uh, we can walk away and be listening and talking over our shoulder. Deaf person does things completely different. Um, they're going to wait for each other, make sure everybody's settled and paying attention. Uh, if you're in a deaf classroom with deaf kids, it's a constant war for attention. Um, but it's essential, and it's one that is not ignored like it might be in a hearing situation where, oh, well, if they're not paying attention, they miss out. In the deaf world, it's that valued. So I thought that was an interesting practical application right there. Um, speaking of how things are done differently, even in just walking around, um, could I have two volunteers that could come up really quickly? All right. One more person. Margarita, come on up. Um, let's say that I have two people. Uh, if you would stand right over there and if you would scoot down just a little bit. Thank you. Let's say that they're having a conversation and they're talking. In our culture, hearing people, we come up here and we're trying to scoot around them, right? Because we're trying to be polite. But in the deaf world, there's not a lot of space elsewhere. I just move on through quickly and that's completely acceptable. Now, if you think about it, that's kind of weird because the deaf people have a visual language and you walk in between the conversation and it's completely acceptable. We have an auditory language that does not, depending on, does not depend on us seeing each other, but we try to skirt our way around. If you are coming up on two deaf people talking, don't do this. Wait for a break in the conversation and then bolt for it. <laughs> And Jenna's saying, yeah, that really bothers me. Don't do that. Just go through. And don't do this trying to be polite. <laughs> That's all I need. Thank you. Just walk on through. Um, deaf people have very good eyes. They see you coming, and they know how to time their conversation for you to just flow on through. But if you're stopping and trying to get out of the way, you're causing a visual distraction, which is actually counterintuitive uh, to your culture but just walk on through. Everything's fine. Um, and you won't need to apologize at all. Is it okay to go around like we typically do? Yes, if there's plenty of space and you want to walk around, that's fine too. It's not a requirement to walk through. <laughs> but oftentimes you've seen how things get around here. Just walk through, it's fine. Um, another thing, I like the fact that whenever we're getting ready for Sunday school, someone goes over and flips the lights on and off to let you know it's time. Guess what? You borrowed something from the deaf world and you didn't even know it. <laughs> deaf people don't have the sound uh, to call out and say, hey, it's time to go to Sunday school. They use the visual or other means, tactile perhaps. Um, so flipping the lights to get someone's attention or to get a group's attention is a very common thing. Um, and the more quickly the lights flash, the more urgent it is. Um, deaf people don't throw things at each other for attention. If you're across the room and you throw something at a deaf person, that's pretty insulting because they value their eyes a lot more than you do. They kind of depend on them. Um, so that's culturally a, 
not the thing to do. But walking up and tapping a deaf person politely on the shoulder, completely acceptable. You can't call out to them. And you don't walk in front of them and wave to get their attention. Just go up and tap them on the shoulder. Um, if you happen to be in front of them, you might wave like that. That's a common getting, someone att getting someone's attention. Um, but you don't have to walk around and, hey, I'm here. You can tap them on the shoulder. Um, as far as entering a conversation is concerned, if you have a group of people standing around and they're chatting in our culture, uh, I don't really know how that works to enter that conversation. Uh, in the deaf world, you go up and you're instantly a part of the conversation. In the hearing world, we don't do things that way. We're really snobbish. <laughs> you're not a part of our conversation and you'll have to figure out whenever you can jump in. Uh, at least that's what a lot of people do, not necessarily you. But we seem to be a little bit more standoffish to people just coming in and joining our conversation. But you'll remember the deaf world's uh, value of being in on everything and understanding what's going on. New person walks up, they are a part of the conversation. And oftentimes they'll put things on hold to catch the person up. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so it's a very interesting difference there. So. I'm sorry if I come up and walk into your conversation and I just stand there like I'm a part of it and things are a little bit awkward. Sorry, that's a carryover from uh, a more polite culture, I suppose, in that respect. And I'm teasing. But it's something that we ought to adopt, I think, in, in one respect. Um, <laughs> something I get from a lot of people. Oh, you went to a deaf college. That must have been very quiet. <laughs> the deaf people can't hear themselves. <laughs> They don't know the noise they're making. Uh, Jenna, did you go to Gallaudet before? Yeah, I graduated from Gallaudet. Would you say that deaf people are quiet? No, not always. <laughs> yeah, generally, they do tend to be more quiet, but you know, at college, I mean, there's all sorts of noises. They're banging on the tables and all of that. It just depends on where. Sorry, I'm forgetting to mirror your signs for the video. Sorry. Um, so I went to Gallaudet and I was in the dorm uh, at Benson Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the tallest storm. There's nine floors. It's much higher than the, any of the others. I was on floor eight, yeah. Um, and those floor eight and floor nine were the party floors. <laughs> I didn't sleep very well, but when I did, I slept. And slept so hard that I slept through fire alarms. And deaf fire alarms, which have strobes, and the old fashioned, we had those old fashioned bells, the really loud, piercing sound. Um, but I got accustomed to being loud. Um, other stories with that, but the deaf world is completely different in how they do things. They depend on visuals, so they might have uh, a doorbell that causes the light to flash inside. When they have their video phone, which has an interpreter on the other end of the line, they have a video camera. They can make phone calls through that. Uh, whenever they're getting a call on that, there's a light that, that flashes on that. Uh -huh. Don't they also uh, uh, on, uh, live on vibrations? Let's ask. Yes, we do depend on vibrations. What about you, Cindy? Yeah, it depends on, you know, I depend on vibrations for uh, my alarm clock and uh, my phone for notifications on my phone. I'm not in the camera? Mm -hmm. Odd. Okay. Yeah, the comments are blocking, but... Uh, I think that they can see that. Thank you for that. 
Um, do deaf people uh, dance? Oh, yeah, we do. I mean, just like y'all do. Deaf people love vibrations. We love to feel the bass. We love to feel the, the loud music. So, so I don't hear the words um, because I can't hear anything, but I do feel the vibrations. You know, like a good example in, here in church, you know, my other church, we have a, a big drum that we use, and I like to use that drum uh, in worship because we can, we can feel the rhythm and we can all worship in song together. You know, hearing people, you can feel the rhythm, you feel the repetition, you're able to, to really be involved with the music, and so it's the same perspective. Um, you know, there's all sorts of variety with sounds and tones and all of those things. So we as deaf people, we, we, are, we tend to be more rhythm focused. And so I like that. I do like it. Um, if this were not a foundation with a, this building were not one with a foundation, uh, I could get someone's attention across the room by stomping and the vibration and they would turn. That's another deaf way. So if we're on the second floor somewhere and you're hearing a lot of pounding and it's the deaf group up there, somebody's wanting someone's attention, that's all. <laughs> a lot of old houses, um, a lot of deaf people would communicate through pounding on the hardwood floors. But today, a lot of houses you know, have con concrete foundations or we have carpet on the floor. Um, but we have technology, we use our phones, we can use the flashlights on our phones, we can call each other on FaceTime, so. I'll explain it from the interpreter's perspective. I would be in a call center. Um, I've done this before where you're in a call center in a cubicle and I have a computer screen in front of me and I have a camera on me and there's a system set up software proprietary to different companies that have uh, VRS, video relay service. Um, and so I would get a phone call from a, a landline or some sort of phone system where I have it on a receiver in my ear, or I would get the call from a deaf person who would pop up on my screen, uh, and I would be the go-between for that phone call. So I've, I've interpreted for people ordering pizza, making drug deals, without my knowledge. Um, yes, the interpreter would know the sign language, yes. Uh, is the other person that doesn't sign also on a video or they no they're on a normal phone so I so a deaf person could call you at home yeah uh, I've interpreted church meetings I've interpreted business calls you name it probably done it I was I was messing around with the drug de drug deal because it generally was and I didn't know what was going on I was just it became it wasn't interpreting it was just say this word say that word and figured it out later I'm like that is bizarre, but <laughs> deaf person can do anything that you or I would do except here. Um, and so the deaf world is just like ours in every respect. They just have different values and see things a little bit differently. Um, something a little bit about history. Do you all know Alexander Graham Bell? The thief that stole a patent. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> he was a notorious eugenicist. He, if that's how you said it. He was into eugenics in his time, one of the leading figures in, in the Americas. Um, he was, say again? Yeah, he was destroying deafness and uh, trying to get rid of deaf culture and deaf people. That was his goal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Alexander Graham Bell um, is a, a well-hated figure in the deaf world. Uh, he, he knew how to sign himself, and he signed ASL very well, um, and yet he would not sign with his deaf wife. Mm -hmm. 
had a deaf wife, refused to sign with her. Um, he, um, he believed that deaf people should not marry deaf people because that would continue on hereditary deafness. And eugenics promoted... Uh, Hitler was big into eugenics, put it that way. Alexander Graham Bell was not to the same extreme. He did not believe in killing, but he, he believed in governmental controls to uh, eliminate disease and lesser races and, and whatnot um, through immigration law or through uh, prohibition of <coughs> deaf people marrying other deaf people and the like. Turns out 90, 95% of deaf people are born to hearing parents. All of that was complete baloney. But he's, just, he's well known as uh, championing uh, oralism, which prohibits the use of sign language, or anything visual for that matter, uh, and trying to train people to speak and read lips. As it turns out, uh, as further study has proven it out to be the case, which deaf people knew all along, lip reading is not possible. Um, Forty percent at most of the sounds in the English language are visible on the lips. Not 40% of the words, 40% of the sounds. Um, so if you were to take a speech and cut out 60% of the sounds uh, and try to figure out what was going on, welcome to deaf life. Much, much more than that, it's extremely taxing. Um, and so lip reading isn't an option. And yet, so in the deaf world, that just gives you a slight snippet of what deaf history has gone through with some of that and shows how uh, the deaf world has a completely different take because you mentioned Alexander Graham Bell to the average uh, school kid. They may, oh yeah, he invented the telephone. Uh, deaf world knows a little bit more about it because they're intimately connected with it. Um, but also shows you some of the medical misconceptions over time. They thought that uh, sterilization of deaf people, forced sterilization of deaf people without them knowing was a good idea at one point um, because they thought that would cut down on deafness. Uh, modern times, a lot of doctors uh, encourage parents to get cochlear implants without giving them all of the information. Um, and it convinces a hearing parent that wants a normal baby to think, oh, my baby will become hearing. His hearing will be fixed, and that's not how things work. And a lot of deaf kids have died because of complications in surgery, or they've gotten the cochlear implant not been allowed access to sign language, grown up not having the training to use the cochlear implant that doesn't make you fully hearing. And so we have language def deprivation on a large scale in a, lot of, in a lot of cases. So the deaf child grows up and they aren't accessing language until much later in life. Did you have something to say on that? So I used to have a cochlear implant and it didn't really help and it really muddled a lot of the sounds. I heard a lot of loud sounds and it caused headaches for me and I felt like this constant striking of my nerves. And so, you know, does a cochlear implant help? Yes, but not always. That's the other thing. You have to be a candidate for a cochlear implant and if you do get the cochlear implant, there's no guarantee that it will work. And even if it works, it won't make you hearing or even able to necessarily hear. Um, the best candidates for a cochlear implant are those who grew up hearing and lost their hearing late and already have uh, a brain adapted to sound. Um, mm. Right. Right. If you have a cochlear implant, it destroys any residu residual hearing that you do have naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are just some pictures of what the deaf world is looking at. And there are a lot of angry, bitter deaf people because of some of those things, um, either in their personal life or things that they've read in history. And, and so... Uh, there's sometimes even a distrust of hearing people 
they don't know who you are, and the only, the only real interactions they've had pe people close to them, oftentimes it's people that won't talk to them, won't try to learn sign language, um, or can't do it very well at school. Um, and so they can be kind of jaded on the idea of the hearing world. Now that's not all people, that's, that's not even most people. But there are a large share of frustrations that most deaf people have gone through in that regard. Um, so the fact that you're here and wanting to learn about that, that speaks volumes. Was, does that mean something for y'all to have people interested in learning about the deaf world? Oh my gosh, it means so much. Um, like just for people to learn something, to be able to to, to talk about things, you know, um, you know, there's so many things that you need to know and, and I would love to share, so. It means the world, even if you're not able to do it well, you might think, oh, I can't do very much more than uh, introduce myself and say, hi, my name is. It makes a difference uh, for people that have been largely ignored, uh, a little bit of common decency, <laughs> an attempt is a wonderful thing. Now, you don't have to know sign language to even do that. Uh, I encouraged the Sunday night before, uh, and in my email, I believe, to the church, that if you aren't comfortable learning sign language or you find yourself really struggling, uh, it's totally fine. If you want to have a conversation with somebody, that's part of the reason I'm here. I'm your mediator. Um, the common joke amongst the deaf world is that the interpreters aren't here for the deaf, they're here for you, because <laughs> you don't know sign language. <laughs> Um, so don't ever feel embarrassed about that. Uh, can I just add one thing? Um, it's like deaf and hearing people, they're going to feel awkward. They're not going to necessarily feel comfortable. But, you know, you can learn a few signs or some phrases or whatever. Deaf people feel awkward with English the same way you feel awkward with sign language. So when, when you know, written English is a struggle, like if there's uh, they have trouble. Yeah, they have trouble, you know, communicating too. So they tend to stick with the deaf people where they're more comfortable. But if there's an interpreter, they're they're there for the mediation between the different cultures and whatnot, and changing one thing, one language to another, and uh, you know, changing sign language to you know, going back and forth between the two cultures so we can enable communication. And so that's, that's why I like to have an interpreter. Um, myself, um, like if I go to a doctor's appointment, you know, trying to take my son or anything, I, I want access to an interpreter. It's, so I'm really thankful for them because I can communicate to the hearing world and to hearing people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I won't go too much into the history of deaf education. Um, that's a long story by itself. There's just been a lot of fraudulent manipulation in different uh, places to convince people to, to adopt certain methods that have already proven to be a failure, causing generations of deaf people to uh, suffer. Um, and in today, even with all that we have as far as terminology and communication, I'm sorry, in, in terms of technology and communication, and access to resources, there are still a lot of uh, pockets around the country where things are not done well in terms of education. So the average deaf person uh, today is in a different situation than they were 10, 20 years ago. Um, there's been a shift toward more mainstream schools, like I talked before, a normal hearing school, but you put the deaf person in that. And there are advantages and disadvantages, of course, but often the people in the administration don't know anything about the deaf world, have not studied it, and don't know who to hire and who's qualified to do the job. Uh, and there are often deaf people that are qualified and have the, the ability to do the job and are not hired because they're deaf and that would require an interpreter in the office and, uh, and the deaf kids uh, are often uh, with no child left behind, they're just passed um, because we can't let them stay here. 
Um, and that, got, that does a great disservice to them because many of them are extremely bright, uh, just not given a shot. So there's the educational system is a failure in that regard, in, lar in a large part due to people not doing their research. There's a lack of parental invo involvement. 88% of the parents not learning sign language to talk with their kids. Um, lip reading is an impossibility, but God has provided sign language. Um, if it were not for that, uh, deaf people would be in an entirely different situation. So that's my little plug for, hey, learn sign language. <laughs> um, it, it's genu genuinely a gift from God. God's providence, um, not to play on the name of the church at all, but just the reality of, of His sovereignty in all things. He has consigned all to disobedience, Romans says, that He have, may have mercy on all. And sign language is one of those things that came out of, of all things, uh, Catholic monks looking for a way to cheat on their vow of silence. They started developing fingerspelling. <laughs> And God's providence brought that through. Uh, even two deaf twins in France, uh, a Catholic priest noticed them using some home signs with one, the, uh, with one another and thought that it was a good idea to establish a deaf school. And from that, the language, uh, I forget how to say the French, but French sign language was born through that. Uh, a man here in America, Thomas Gallaudet, uh, saw a deaf girl all by herself not playing with anyone else uh, found out she was deaf uh, her father was wealthy enough to send him on a mission to Europe to try to figure out how can I educate my daughter uh, he went he went to Britain first uh, they wanted money uh, so he went to France and came in contact with this deaf school in France and a deaf, a deaf teacher from there Laura Claire, his son name is this, because of a scar he had there, um, came to America with Thomas Gallaudet, learned, I want to say he learned English in a three-month boat ride to, and knows English better than I do, I think. His writing is phenomenal. Um, and they established the first deaf school here in America. So we have a strong French influence. But God's doing all of this all along and providing deaf people with sign language is genuinely uh, one of those divine intervention things where apart from his hand orchestrating the whole thing, deaf people would be lost and without hope in the world because they wouldn't have the gospel. And the gospel is able to be given to them um, because of language. Uh, so I think that that's amazing. Um, for a long time though, even though sign language was being used, it was looked down upon because it was not viewed as equal to English it, or whatever spoken language was in that country. A lot of deaf people for a long time were even ashamed of it. And so it, in a restaurant or whatnot, they would sign below the table to one another, hiding the fact that they used sign language because it was looked down on as uh, lesser than. Uh, in 1960, a man named William Stokey, his sign name is this, Um, he started going to Gallaudet University. He would wear a kilt and go out with a bagpipe in the early morning, I believe. If I have the story right. Uh, which I, I found fascinating on a deaf campus. But at any rate, he was a linguist and he started recording uh, a lot of sign language in written form and different symbols that he created actually was able to study it out and definitively prove that American Sign Language was an actual language. Um, not just a communication form that was lesser than, but a bona fide, linguistically proven language. Um, and since that time, there's been great strides uh, moving forward with, uh, with, within the deaf world as it, as, sorry relating to sign language um, and deaf education. Through all of that, God's working in all of that, um, we now have here in America probably one of the stronger um, 
havens for deaf people, so to speak, compared to around the world where a lot of times they're still going through some of the same things that, uh, that American deaf people had to deal with back in the day. Um, but with all of that being said, less than 2% of deaf people consider themselves to be Christian. That's a worldwide number. But that's in name only. And I'm not sure what that means. That may mean Catholics as well uh, and various different sects. Less than 2% call themselves Christian. And we know what Christ said about uh, there will be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord. And he will have to respond, I never knew you. Um, so you start to see a picture of, hey, you have a mission field in your backyard. Another plug. Come to the class March 1st. <laughs> start learning some. I mentioned before, ASL is visually based, not sound based. So there's big difference there. But I wanted to, um, I wanted to show you something of ASL, linguistically speaking, to show you the complexity of it. Because if you, somebody asked me earlier about questions and how they're phrased differently. The grammar is different, but the first thing I want you to see is the formation of a word in sign language is incredibly complex. So you have five different parameters that make up one word. Uh, the first is hand shape. And that has to do with what you just learned with finger spelling, the shape of your hand. Um, the second one is location. That's where you're signing uh, a particular thing. You have palm orientation. It has to do with whether your palm is forward or back, my versus your, like we learned earlier, there, its, um, movement. This is the most important one. I can take away uh, all of the other, well, I can take away hand shape uh, and palm orientation, and I can communicate with fists. I was emphasizing how movement is the most important. Yeah, I can understand that. I took away hand shape um, and palm orientation and kept movement. And the next one that we'll mention, maybe movement and this next one are the two equally important top ones, um, which is non-manual markers or non-manual signals. Who knows what manual means? It means actively uh, uh, doing it uh, manually. With your hands. With my hands. Exactly. And my facial exactly. So manually is with your hands. So non-manual markers or non-manual signals is what's not on your hands. So it has to do with your posture, your facial expression. Um, all of those things. So each one of these plays a critical word, uh, a critical part of a single word or a single phrase. You change one of these, it changes the entire meaning. Um, summer. I'm just going to change the location. Ugly. <laughs> I'm just going to change the location. Dry. Um, you can change your non-manual marker and you can change it from a question to a statement. Uh, you can change your palm orientation and you're either talking about them or you. Uh, or you can just change one of these and all of a sudden you don't make any sense at all. <laughs> but that's the formation of a single word. And so 
we look at that and we say, oh, that's complex. Once you start learning, it's not that bad. But I want to show you that it's, it's pretty intricate. It's not some made-up thing. It's a genuine language um, that has <laughs> great complexity. As far as the question about syntax or grammar, the word order of the language is different than ours, typically. Uh, some people say that it's closer to Spanish, and that's... In English, I believe that most of the time we have subject, object, verb. I'm sorry, subject, verb, object. This can be moved around, and English is weird, and we do all sorts of strange things with it. Um, and the same can be said of deaf people and ASL. But the typical formal, clean way of doing everything is typically starting with time. Remember we talked about the cultural value of clarity and logic and time-ordered communication. This comes right into play in how you structure a sentence or a story. And you typically set the frame of reference in time first. And then you have uh, subject or object, either one of these, but typically subject, object, then verb. What this does is it sets things up visually. You set up your reference of when this, is, this event is happening. You set up everything that's in the scene, subjects and objects. And then you show everything moving. Um, that's the way it was first explained to me. It's way more complex than this. Language always is. But it gives you a picture of how things are rearranged depending on cultural value and the way that the language itself is structured. Um, so it gives you another picture of why you don't see me um, signing word for word for word for word when I'm interpreting. I'm not just interpreting culturally, but I'm also interpreting linguistically. I'm not, in, I'm not transliterating. Transliterating is where you take a word uh, in a language and you find as best you can the equivalent or even force it into the other language. Um, some words in the Bible are transliterated uh, and we've adopted them. And they become words to us in English, but they originated elsewhere. Um, transliterating as a practice amongst interpreters is more following the English word order and the English signs, um, trying to follow the English language itself. That's not what I'm doing every Sunday. Some of that may happen <laughs> when I'm tired, but I'm interpreting, I meaning I'm, I'm going from this, I'm thinking through what it means, and I'm reordering it, putting it out in a different way. There are six different steps with that from what I believe is the best model for interpreting, explaining how it works. The first stage is you're hearing or seeing the language. You're taking that code in. Language is a code for meaning. So you're taking in that code. Secondly, you're deconstructing it in your mind. You're undressing all of the, all of the whatever that is in the language. You're, you're peeling all of that away to get at the core of the meaning. Then you're taking that meaning and then you're analyzing it and thinking that through. What does this actually mean? Then you're redressing it, you're recoding it into your, your target language. Then you're actually putting it out, in this case on a Sunday morning, on my hands. And then sixth, as that's coming out, I'm also watching to make sure that I made sense. If I didn't make sense, I've got to go back to the beginning all while the next concept is coming forth from the speaker and it's a continual process. That's what's happening in interpreting. It sounds scarier than it is. Don't let that put you off of becoming an interpreter if you'd like to be one because this is a trained thing, but that shows you that it's not simply what's the word for. It's a whole different language with a whole different word order and a whole different set of words in that respect. What's that process again? That's a... Uh, that's a model for what's happening in interpreting. Um, 
you're taking in a language. You're decoding it. You're analyzing the meaning. You're recoding it into the other language. You're then putting it out or performing it, saying it. And then you're, uh, it's called your feedback loop. You're watching to make sure that what you're putting out makes sense. And then if you need to, you have to repair it. Yes, sometimes I put it out just fine and the deaf person goes, huh? Because they may not have seen that sign before. Just like you may not have heard an English word before. Or I may not have framed it well. I may have used good signs, but I haven't set it up and I haven't set up the time. And maybe I left out a subject or an object in what's happening here. Or logically, does it make sense? And Janice saying, yeah, then I'm lost. So then I'm watching if... I feel like I'm doing fine and I suddenly see the deaf person going I go whoa I gotta make sure I gotta clean this up I gotta figure out how to keep what's coming in and go back and fix and catch up and yeah so how do you witness because is it like the stronger um, the more you study the Bible like you know there's words like I hate to pick this one but I like to hear the word in Greek, it could either mean to physically hear or to sexually hear, and other languages knew that, but like in Spanish, you can have a wheel, or a or anything there, you can have three words for that. So, would it help you if you knew Greek? Could you then... I want to. I want to. Um, I would love to, in the future, be able to have a... Uh, Jewish Old Testament and a Greek New Testament and be interpreting straight from that on Sunday. Love that. That's a long-term goal. In the present, I'm interpreting from the English. Uh, now... And the more you understand, the more you see, exactly. then you understand. Right. That's why we're not going to have a Catholic come in here and interpret for us in our church service. That's why we won't have a charismatic come in and interpret uh, 1 Corinthians... 14. Theologically, your understanding impacts your word choices and how you frame things and what, what your ultimate goal is because if I'm interpreting a passage I know, I'm going to be setting it up beforehand because I know where the punchline is. I know what the point of the text is and that's going to change how I frame things. Um, Right. Yeah. If y'all get involved in it, that will not be your first step. I'm not going to throw you into interpreting the sermons. Yeah. If you were to be actually involved, we would train you to memorize a song first and hymn of the month. It's the same thing and you don't have to worry about it. I will walk through it with you and teach you, okay, here's what we do. Or have a deaf person walk through it with you. That's way in the future. At first, we got a baby steps. Uh, my name is... Diane. I'll, I'll say if you're wanting to learn sign language, don't think too far ahead. Right. Because I'm one of these that does that, and I got so frustrated trying to learn them that I, that I messed myself up. You know. Okay. Just calm down. Just take, it, yeah. just take it step by step and just learn what you're supposed to have in front of you, and, and it'll come. The goal is not to become an interpreter next week. <laughs> the goal is to be able to talk to a deaf person in the body of Christ uh, for the purpose of acting like the body of Christ. Uh, not everyone will be able to do that. Uh, but if you have that desire and you're able to learn to talk for yourself, it takes a large burden off of me during fellowship time. You can talk for yourself. I'm not having to interpret. <laughs> so you're already playing a, an essential role. Uh, but the other stuff comes much later. So... Yeah, deaf people read and write um, at varying levels and very varying degrees, just like there are varying levels and varying degrees of people that can use sign language. Um, it's not the biggest preference, but if you're really stuck, 
do whatever you have to. And when I was in England, uh, I was at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, Spurgeon's Church. Uh, Gil was there too, a lot of other great men, but um, I was there for about a month and I was learning British Sign Language and one of the things that I so appreciated about their British culture being a little bit different as far as schooling is concerned, not that not to compare education systems, but in the deaf world, um, they have interpreters, but then they also have something called CSW, Communication Service Worker. And the perspective as far as the role between interpreter and CSW is completely different. CSW will do whatever it takes for the understanding to, go, to get across, draw a picture, lay out a diagram, act it out, whatever it takes so that, it's, that whatever it's trying to get across is finally understood. Interpreter is there, I'm just interpreting. And it's the teacher's job to, to do all that. And there are places for both of those roles. But in your role, when you're in a personal conversation with someone, you're a CSW. Do whatever you've got to do, even if you feel silly. The point is the message. The point is the gospel if you're that far along. Um, and you do the best that you can and you trust the Lord. And if I'm there, grab me and I'll interpret. Um, I was also taught that uh, if you just finger spell the word that you're trying to grow, that person will show you the sign for it. Isn't that correct? So that you can continue to learn. Mm. Right. what I was told a couple of years mm. ago in my last class. Mm. Yes, especially on, on that issue, yeah. Now, as you're learning sign language, I will tell you not to fingerspell a word. What's the sign for? Um, but in the conversation of trying to witness to someone or whatnot, definitely do that. Um, I'm just speaking from the linguist's perspective of you want to detach from your original language, your mother tongue. You want to detach from that and delve into the other. Because words, are not equi- the words do not weigh the same across languages. Uh, what does that mean? Movement speed. All right, you're you're actually running, okay? But what's another usage of the word run? A path that animals go up and down. A path animals go up and down. A dog run, okay. Uh, a faucet can run. Somebody said that. What's another meaning of the word run? Hose. Air on hose. You got a run in your hose. No one will ever be able to say that of me. <laughs> um, it depends on the hose. Depends on the hose, too. All right. A hose can run, can it? A water hose? Different type of run, a different type of action. All right. Washing machine is running. Some sort of machinery is running. What's another meaning? I'll stop it short. There's 40 or 50 or 60. I can't remember the number exactly. I think it's in the 50s of different usages and meanings of the word run. Now, if you ask a deaf person, how do you sign run? And they give you the one where you're running. And then you say your washing machine is running. I look at you go, what are you talking about? <laughs> Words are not... Uh, directly exchangeable always. Uh, That's one reason why the theology is so hard for me. That's why I need your prayers. Um, Sometimes I'm having to develop a multiple sign equivalency, uh, sufficiency or sufficient, sufficient. That's two signs all in one. And I've made a visual rhyme enough and completely um, it's not fully what I'd like as far as meaning is concerned, but if that's able to be taught and that foundation is there and that's understood, that's a new sign, there's some meaning inherent in that. And then if they've learned what that means, they know what's being conveyed, um, justified, being clean, and you have that label, being called clean, called right. That's another visual rhyme of sorts. Um, I like that. Just Justified, to... yep. Um, there are different things like that where you can't substitute one word 
for another. You can get close. It's another reason why it's helpful to go back to the Greek and Hebrew. Uh, but so I hope that gives you a better picture. It's not a word for word exchanging. That's a sticky one. Uh, you know what I mean? No, I, I, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, whoever does the translating, their theology will bleed through um, without them even knowing, probably. Um, because see, if they're doing the interpreting thing where they're going from one language to another, they are analyzing the meaning and deciding this is what it means. Here's how I package it in the other language. Um, there is a project going on where they are translating the Bible into a signed form. I can definitively say that they are... It's called the Deaf Bible app. Yeah. I can de definitively say that there are massive theological errors in it. I think unintentionally. And yet, it's, for some people, the only tool they have access in. So there's good and there's bad. Um, whoever does translating will have an impact. What, one of the people look at me sideways in the deaf world about that. I'll give an example. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit, whenever it's being translated in, in that signed version, um, it's produced as the fruit of the Spirit typically brings about or typically is this. That's a, that's a deviation um, that completely alters the meaning. Um, now, don't ask me how to do it. Yes. Signed typically? You look it up, yeah. I'll show you after, yeah. And there are, there are problems like that that are easy to overlook. Um, but there's also passages that are so well done that it's just beautiful, and I, I use it. Um, so that's why I say it's sticky. So yes and no, they're not even finished with that translation completely yet. So the hard answer is no <laughs> in one respect, and yet they're working on that. And with any translation, it's not going to be perfect either. So that's extremely hard to deal with. Um, I believe it's the place of the local church to be teaching properly. And if we're doing that, teaching Scripture is a means for explaining what the text actually means properly. It's a means for teaching English. Um, the Word of God is a wonderful tool there. And it would be greatly beneficial to have a signed version of the Bible. And yet at the same time, that's also a difficult one because historically, anytime a missionary has gone in to translate a Bible, the first thing that they do is they develop a written form of that language, which is auditorily based, but they develop a, a written form of the language and they translate it into that and they have to teach the people how to read. Um, that has not been done with the deaf world in the same way. Um, and it's a three-dimensional, not sound-based, visually-based language. How do you create a written form for that? It's one of those dilemmas where you're, you're having to grapple with what's historically accepted as translation versus what's practically <laughs> capable of happening, putting down a three-dimensional visually spatial language onto paper, that's extremely difficult. So that's, that's why I say it's sticky. But I have to expand on that, otherwise I'll be misunderstood. I hope that makes sense. Do we have any other questions? Since we're on that train of thought. Sure. Hmm. Hopefully, idealistically, they're taught in their native language how to break down the language uh, grammatically, linguistically. Some deaf people are hard of hearing, and so they have some natural input there, and it's easier for them. Um, it depends on the person, and it depends on the school. So I don't have a, an easy way of answering that. But does it help a little bit? 
So if I'm understanding what you're telling us, like whenever you turn on the caption or the deaf community, does that mean that that doesn't make sense because of the way they form sentences is so differently in ASL or is there does that does that serve? It depends on the literacy of the person and how accurate the captioning, and if the captioning even has punctuation, and if the captioning is even accurate. YouTube automatic captions are horrid. Um, it, so it's a variety of factors, but even the more astute deaf people that are extremely adept with English, I know some that are better with English than I am, which is embarrassing in one respect. But. The captioning isn't an equal thing for them, no. Yeah. Even though the English is there and they understand it, it's not the same. One more. If you say that you don't translate word by word, mm -hmm. you can say the meaning. Right. Does it mean that, that like the Spanish or the Hungarian sign language is similar to the English? Or is it easier for us, an American deaf person to talk to Hungarian deaf? Yes, because they're both visually and spatially based. Um, rendezvous is a French word, and I've said that like a redneck. <laughs> um, but that's been adopted in our language easily because it's audit an auditorily based language. Uh, what's interestingly fascinating about deaf languages, though, is that most of them have a similar grammatic structure. And sign languages have another unique thing that we don't quite have in the same respect that is beautiful. They are able to show what's happening in a scenario with something called classifiers. Classifiers are or they are not signs and they're not, not language. They're a unique part of the language that can show action and size and placement and action and all these things visually. Um, add to that fact that deaf people are more adept at miming typically uh, or gesturing. And so you get two deaf people internationally together. There are some signs that may even cross over, it's rare, but they are able to get by on basic conversation. When I was at Gallaudet, I got there two weeks early for orientation, and that's the same time all the international students got there. None of them had learned sign language yet. In America, they had learned sign language in their country, so they spoke a different language. We had conversations, where did you grow up? This is what my life was like. I went to this school, I went to that school. Uh, and we didn't use language in the linguistic sense. We used um, a portion that both, both languages share, which is visually based communication that is naturally adaptive. That makes any sense. And with the grammar being similar, there's, there's a lot of latitude there. I wasn't able to get down to the gospel. I wasn't that. There's only so far you can go with that. But you can communicate for sure. Yeah. For Americans, sixth grade. For, for the deaf, two, three, four, two to four uh, grade level in, in reading and writing English, and that's an average. Like I said, I know deaf people that have better English than I do. So you gotta take that with a grain of salt. The average American uh, reads and writes with a sixth grade reading level. So there is a gap there, um, but that has to do with their working in a language they have never been able to hear before. The Americans that have a sixth grade reading level have a bigger problem, I think, because they have a free access to English all the time. Um, so they've had it easier. The deaf person that's worked themselves up to third or fourth grade reading level has done a remarkable job working in a language that they cannot physically hear. So it's pretty incredible. A um, few examples real quick, just to show some differences in, in the language and how important structure is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23. Um, if I follow the English and I don't um, 
I don't sign exact English, I'm just signing, I'm using ASL words, but I'm using the English word order. Here's what it comes out to be. Um, now that's a little bit manipulated, but it means, it comes off as, the Lord is my shepherd, I do not want him. Simple mistake. Um, they shall all be taught of God, John six forty five. Now I'm breaking a few rules there, but following the English word order comes out to uh, they shall all teach God. Whoa. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, it's important to have a good interpreter. <laughs> um, All of this has a, a big impact, and you're going to make mistakes, and it'll be funny. <laughs> be able to laugh at yourself. Um, the deaf people have put up, put up with you a long way. Um, you have to be willing to take that jump. Yep. All right, so we talked about interpreting is not word for word. Uh, the other thing I wanted to throw out was processing time. Um, when I'm interpreting I'm not right up on what's being said I'm behind so whenever you say a joke or something and the deaf pe people don't laugh till a minute or so afterwards it's not that they're slow, I am <laughs> uh, so that I can do that process of breaking down the language getting the full concept you may take a while before you actually get to a point and taking that breaking it down repurposing it and putting it out. A um, few quick tidbits just so that you're comfortable with working with an interpreter. Um, talk to the deaf person, not to the interpreter. Just they're there. That's who you're talking to. Direct yourself to them. I'll try to stay out of the way and in their sight line so that things are more comfortable and, and natural. Talking to the interpreter while they're doing the work doesn't work because I'm behind, I'm still catching up. You've asked a question and you're waiting for me to finish the thought so that I can ask myself the question and then turn the answer while trying to not butcher their language so they're not left out of the situation. It just doesn't work. <laughs> it's just rude. It, it actually, it comes off that way sometimes in some situations. Uh, I, I can completely understand trying to talk to the interpreter during uh, something and it just doesn't work. So just a heads up on that. I was asked, someone asked, uh, how do I invite the deaf people or deaf group over for dinner? I said, well, invite me some other time, but I'll come and interpret your dinner for the deaf people. That will totally work if you want to do that. <laughs> but uh, I won't be able to be in the conversation and interpret at the same time. It doesn't work. That's why I have two interpreters here with us. So um, you have to be able to, uh, you should be looking at the person you're talking to. Right. Yeah, you're just talking to who you're talking to. Yeah. I try to stay out of the way as, as much as possible. Uh, if I am in a situation I can't really talk for myself while I'm interpreting, that's disrupting my job. Um, if you do have deaf people in, in your audience, providing resources beforehand to the interpreter helps them prepare ahead of time. Uh, Tommy has helped me a lot with this. Corey has been amazing. Um, providing me the sermon beforehand so that I can read through the text that we're going to be looking at and have an idea of, okay, I've got to know how to put this concept forth and I can prepare beforehand. So those are some useful tools. There's way too much more to discuss, but I wanted to give you a general overview. Does anybody have any more questions before we close? I was just going to ask you, I'm curious about this. Uh, uh, out of all the you know, sign languages of the world. Is there one that's more popular or that has a bigger audience? ASL is the most widely used, and that's only because of our education efforts overseas. Um, ASL is also used in Canada. That goes a long way. But then we, Americans have gone to Africa and established a lot of schools, and there's so, so there's a lot of carryover. Um, but that's hard to measure, and I'm guessing when I say that. But I believe that it's ASL. Uh, we had a, my 
old church, we had a group that went to Benin, uh, and they were following the French. Mm. But they were going to teach them some American, but they really, mm. I, I think it was because originally it was a French colony, mm. so they were already set with the French. But then again, it was all rural, the area and mm -hmm. everything, so... All right, you'll have a pocket that's that's developing its own language within the people that are there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do the deaf people have anything they want to add that might be useful? As far as um, knowing, uh, I've known you for how many years, TJ? Like 12 years, 11 years? Okay, sorry. Um, I've seen you interpret, and he he's very skilled. TJ is excellent. He's an excellent interpreter. Uh, he's a very good cultural mediator, uh, as are the other interpreters. You know, I've seen others that aren't skilled, and, and, and it's because he's dived so deeply into the language. He's been to Gallaudet. He's had many, many opportunities for learning the language himself. He's learned the culture, and he has completely immersed himself, basically almost drowned himself in it and been living in it. And so the language structure and, and how to interpret is important, and it will, but you can't just interpret without understanding the structure of the language. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to have a conversation with someone. What is the best acceptable um, way to support Let's ask. What's your preference? What was the question again? I missed it. I'm sorry. How, how should someone come to you and try to talk with you and communicate with you um, if I'm not here to interpret and they want to try to have a conversation with you? There's different ways um, you can text on your phone. There's an app called uh, Big B-I-G, I believe. Uh, let me look at my phone and, and see... Yeah, the name of the app is uh, Big, B-I-G, um, and it's, it's a texting app um, that enables you to, uh, to write in big letters back and forth. And so um, you, if you have the same app, um, it enables you to write, or you could start gestures, or you can learn from me. You know, start with fingerspelling and, and just learn signs. So it takes two people to communicate. So you'd be surprised. You, you, you might learn you know, several more uh, words uh, just through talking with a deaf person. So don't be afraid. So you have to think about the time period that we're in uh, and the amount of time that it takes. So writing back and forth, I mean, you know, you have to look for a pen, you have to look for a notepad, and then say you're in a, a large setting where there's a lot of people, you know, writing back and forth would take forever, but we have our phones, we have our smartphones, and we can text back and forth. And so I have my own apps that I can communicate with waiters or different people at restaurants, and I, I save those sentences on the app so I can just automatically pull them up rather, rather than typing them all out. So I use that a lot, but the best mode is, is through the phone. You know, and it's nice because they have autocorrect on the phone, so you don't have to worry about your spelling. And so it's nice, you know, we, it's the same for us, you know, sometimes we don't know how to spell things and we have autocorrect. So I've found myself using my phone pretty heavily to communicate with hearing people generally. Anything else? You're more than welcome to come and ask me. I'm getting from the audience. Y'all have had great questions. And he's answered things well. Yeah, I'm, 
and TJ can answer from his own experience as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's interesting, um, the, the history that Providence uh, has. So I live in Sugar Land, uh, closer to Stafford, and uh, my son uh, signs. He's standing right there, the interpreter that's voicing for me. That's my, that's my son. And uh, he has a good friend um, who he was neighbors with and uh, they were best friends for a while, and his parents invited him to come here, um, something to do with the youth, uh, the youth group. And uh, they had a, a special trip to, I'm trying to remember, uh, Missouri, not Missouri City, Texas, Missouri Youth Challenge, I'm forgetting the name of it. Yes, that's it, that's it. So, so he went to that and his life is transformed there through uh, going with the group here from Providence. And, uh, and we were going to um, Southwest Presbyterian and uh, that's where he had grown up. So he was very familiar um, with the Reformed doctrine and the Reformed faith. And, um, and so he talked about Providence often and talked about how he enjoyed this church. And I was like, oh, okay, I just knew about Providence. And then, you know, he got married and, well, he went out to college and got married. And, and then TJ showed up and talked about Providence. And I was like, oh, this is the same Providence. And I went to Hana and I was like, is this the same Providence that you were talking about? And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just interesting just meeting people throughout the community. Good question. I'm glad to have interpreters here. Thank you both. We're going to close this, but if you have any more questions, come and let me know.